I'm Tom Gentles um, from Auckland, New Zealand. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak today um, at this excellent session. Um, I'm going to talk about the role of echocardiography in the differential diagnosis of inflammatory valve disease, um, especially bacterial endocarditis, SLE, JRA, and acute rheumatic fever. I've got no conflicts to declare. Um, firstly, um, it's probably worthwhile to discuss the relative incidence of rheumatic heart disease and endocarditis um, in, in various countries around the world, and certainly in New Zealand. Um, we have quite a high um, incidence of rheumatic heart disease, um, largely amongst the indigenous Maori and, uh, and Pacific Island immigrant communities in Auckland. Um, we also see quite a bit of rheumatic heart disease from neighbouring Pacific Islands. And because of that, we have quite a high um, incidence of bacterial endocarditis. Um, going back into the 1950s um, in the United States, when endocarditis, so when rheumatic heart disease was, was endemic and, and acute rheumatic fever was common, bacterial endocarditis, um, uh, about 50 to 70% of endocarditis was on rheumatic um, valves. Um, and clearly in Western Europe, at least, um, the um, incidence of rheumatic heart disease is much lower. It's quite an unusual disease. Um, and consequently, I suspect um, the incidence of endocarditis is also lower. So I'm going to run through the various entities um, and have a few um, case um, discussions or, or, or case presentations within those, um, just to highlight some of the commonalities and some of the differences um, um, with these valvulopathies. Um, first up, infectious endocarditis. Um, the major criteria and the Duke criteria are positive blood cultures and evidence of endocardial involvement. And kind of importantly, this um, endocardial involvement is, is usually seen with echocardiography. And, and the characteristic finding is an oscillating intracardiac mass on a valve or supporting structure. And if we look at these echocardiograms, this is a, um, a staph tricuspid valve endocarditis. This is a coronavirus, uh, so coronabacterium um, endocarditis on a mitral valve. Um, and you can see how, how this oscillating mass um, exhibits independent motion or motion independent of the actual valve. There's all kind of stuff that's flapping around here. Um, and same here, this is a fairly dramatic um, 3D image of a, looks like a rat eating the mitral valve, but a very large nasty vegetation. Intracardiac complications of bacterial endocarditis are quite common, unfortunately. Um, pericardial effusions can be seen in rheumatic um, fever and, and the other arthropathies, um, but in this patient um, with bacterial endocarditis with staph aureus on the mitral valve um, also had infection in the pericardium. Aortic root abscess, this is the aortic valve here, and this is the abscess. Um, is pretty pathognomonic of bacterial endocarditis. Um, and um, this is a patient who has a conal ventricular septal defect with endocarditis on the VSD and the aortic valve and rupture of a, of a sinus of Valsalvar aneurysm. Embolic phenomena um, are common um, in, uh, in bacterial endocarditis. Um, this is an example of a, of a brain abscess in a, in a child with endocarditis. Um, this is a patient of mine who had rheumatic heart disease um, and had endocarditis on an aortic valve, rheumatic aortic valve, um, and he's got little spots throughout his brain, um, unfortunately, that, that are um, septic emboli. There's a larger one just here. And of course, one can have emboli to the eye. These are the characteristic Roth spots with pale centers, um, and also to the kidneys and the fingers um, and other organs. Uh, moving on to SLE, cardiovascular involvement is common and seen in between 10 and 50% of patients, depending on the series. Um, in our experience in children, pericarditis and pericardial effusion are, uh, are the commonest presentations with some unusual presentations related to vascular thrombus, um, vasculitis, and spontaneous arterial dissection. And this is an example of a patient whose first presentation with SLE was with tamponade, um, and this required drainage. Um, and here is a, another patient who presented in cardiogenic shock. 
um, and uh, had SLE um, and also had thrombosis of the left anterior descending and of the circumflex coronary arteries that were treated with percutaneous stenting. This is a large study from the United States. Um, it's administrative data from, from discharge coding from throughout the US. Um, large number of, of patients with SLE um, and grouped according to age. And, and you can see that those, the younger age group, the children tended to present with myopericarditis. It was the, the much commoner than, than the adult presentation, um, whilst the adults um, were much more likely to have valvular insufficiency. These are young adults here and older adults um, in the purple here. So valvular problems much commoner in adults and my, myopericardial problems commoner in children. Um, and that's echoed by this lovely um, report um, from Cape Town published recently, 93 children with lupus um, and about 30% of them had cardiac manifestation. Um, and most of these were pericardial effusion. There were also some um, ventricular hypertrophy and, and valve dysfunction, um, severe valve dysfunction. Um, some children had more than one cardiac pathology, clearly. Um, none of them had vegetations, um, and, and vegetations are characteristic of valve involvement in older people and adults. And what's seen from, is, is demonstrated in this pathological specimen are these small vegetations on the cords and on the mitral valve leaflet surface um, that are fibroblastic, um, have a neutrophil monocyte infiltrate, and are known as Liebman Sachs endocarditis after the two New York cardiologists who first um, described them um, in the 1920s, but they are rare in childhood. Um, Aortitis and SLE um, is generally considered rare as well. Um, this is a small selected series in Auckland, 13 children with um, SLE who had an echocardiogram. Um, they were collated by Anthony Concannon, who was a cardiology fellow with us um, and is now both a, a pediatric rheumatologist and, uh, and a cardiologist. Um, but um, Anthony found quite a high incidence of mitral regurgitation um, in those patients. They're all clinically indicated echocardiograms though. Um, mostly trivial and mild mitral regurgitation, but also quite a high incidence, almost 40% with aortic root dilatation um, and, uh, and also aortic regurgitation. Now, some of this may have been related to hypertension um, because um, some of these children had um, kidney involvement as well, um, but it does raise the question as to whether there's some aortitis in these children in addition to the other, other inflammatory changes. Um, this is a 12-year-old girl who initially presented with pericardial effusion, but also had mitral regurgitation. Um, it's, uh, it's not insignificant. Um, and if we look at the mitral valve here, we can see the leaflets are thickened. And, um, and there's something sitting here on this anterior leaflet kind of caudal junction. And if we just stop that echocardiogram, we can see there's a discrete little um, mass there, which is probably one of these Lehman sex. Um, vegetations. There may be other things in here, but it's easy to read um, stuff into uh, an echocardiogram like this when you're looking carefully. What about JRA? Well, there's very little written about the cardiac manifestations of JRA in children. Um, this is a report from Germany from about 10 years ago. Um, 40 children with HLA-B27 positive arthropathy, 10% of them had aortic regurgitation, um, and, uh, and one of them, the AR, was severe. Um, as with adults, they found impaired diastolic function, although only with um, exercise. Um, this is a case that came through our department quite a few years ago. Um, a, a girl with JRA, um, a really sad story, onset two to three years of age, very severe um, articular involvement. Her mother had SLE and her father had psoriasis, so there was always a little debate about this diagnosis, but it seemed over the years that she, in fact, did have JRA and did not have SLE. Um, anyway, she presented at 16 years of age to us, um, having been wheelchair-bound since the age of about eight, um, and she presented with a fever and a heart murmur. Um, she had uh, multiple blood cultures that were negative, but because of the echocardiographic findings, which we'll look at, um, she was treated for culture negative um, endocarditis. And this is the mitral valve here and, and the posterior leaflet. And you can see there's this mass attached to the posterior leaflet. And it's a little different 
um, to the vegetations that we saw in the bacterial endocarditis section of this talk in that it doesn't seem to move independently of the, of the leaflet. It seems to be stuck to the leaflet. Now, there may be something flapping around here that could potentially be a bacterial, bacterial vegetation, um, but this doesn't look typical um, for bacterial endocarditis. Um, and here we are, there's a little bit of mitral regurgitation. There's also a bit of mitral stenosis too. There's a mean grain of about six millimeters across this valve. Now, 15 years later, this is the same patient. And you can see um, this is the mass that we saw in the posterior leaflet, which is probably a bit bigger than it was. But the posterior leaflet itself is rigid. It's hardly moving. Um, the anterior leaflet, um, again, is, is kind of rigid and has a little mass on it as well. Um, and there's pretty significant mixed mitral valve disease here. Um, there's, there's quite significant mitral stenosis and there's also mitral regurgitation. And when we look at the aortic valve, we also see thickening of that valve um, and there's a moderate degree of aortic regurgitation. So this is progression of disease over 15 years. What about rheumatic heart disease? Well, as we know, this is a multi-phase disease. There's an acute phase with inflammation that goes for weeks and months and a chronic phase that really goes over years um, and results in scarring of the caudal apparatus and the valve leaflets. And in those children who have recurrent strep infection, there's this cycle of acute on chronic inflammation. Of course, benzathine penicillin can interrupt that um, that cycle and, and, and penicillin is the mainstay of treatment for these children. The diagnosis of acute rheumatic fever has been by the Jones criteria and these, these have been modified over the past decade or more um, at, to include subclinical valve disease as a major criteria. Um, and, and this is echocardiographically detected um, valve disease. This is not without its problems. Um, differentiation from physiological regurgitation can be difficult. This is a really minor jet. It's not pan-systolic. It's pretty um, short in its, um, its penetration into the left atrium, whilst this jet looks to be systolic and, and have a much um, longer um, jet into the left atrium. And thanks to, um, to Bo Remney and Nigel Wilson and, um, and um, other folks from around the world, um, this entity of pathological regurgitation um, has been fairly robustly defined in a way that differentiates it from physiological regurgitation in many cases or most cases. Um, and you can see that the criteria that have been defined here for pathological mitral regurgitation include a Doppler jet of more than two centimetres seen in two views. Um, the jet's pan systolic and has a maximum velocity of more than three metres per second. Um, with Doppler, and the aortic criteria are similar, um, though slightly different. Well, with chronic rheumatic heart disease, we see fibrosis that involves the leaflets in the caudal apparatus. Um, this results in leaflet thickening, caudal thickening, shortening, and elongation, and with volume load, the secondary annular dilatation. And this causes a variety of, of structural and functional abnormalities of, of the um, aortic um, so the mitral and the aortic valve. In the same group have defined these abnormalities quite nicely um, and certainly leaflet thickening, which is a fairly subjective thing, um, has been defined in um, numeric terms. And, and if you're less than 20 years of age and you have a leaflet thickness of, of, um, of uh, less than three millimetres, then that's normal and there are various instructions for how um, gain settings and harmonic settings should be set. Um, subcortal thickening and shortening um, is, is a, a fairly characteristic um, rheumatic finding um, and, um, and you can see here how short these cords are. Um, and you can see over here in this pathological specimen, these cords, cords have been inflamed, they've matted, they've shortened, they've lengthened. Um, they're really quite abnormal in these rheumatic valves. Um, this restricted diastolic motion of the anterior leaflet is really characteristic of rheumatic heart disease. And you have this hockey stick deformity, um, as it's called. Um, and, and in addition to that, 
the systolic motion of the anterior leaflet is frequently abnormal. And you can see here how this, the, in systole, the anterior leaflet's riding above the posterior leaflet. Now, this is partly because of long, um, elongated cordi in the, in the um, anterior leaflet, but it's also partly because of um, retraction um, of the posterior leaflet and shortening of the cordi of the posterior leaflet. And these um, abnormalities cause the characteristic findings in this kind of acute on chronic mitral valve problem um, that this child has. Um, you can see how buckled the leaflets are and how that anterior leaflet rides over the posterior leaflet, giving us severe mitral regurgitation. The aortic valve changes in chronic rheumatic heart disease are similar. Um, there's leaflet thickening, um, there's restricted leaflet motion. Um, and um, there's leaflet prolapse, as we see over here, um, and a central coaptation defect or some type of coaptation defect, very large in this example, but not necessarily um, as severe, fortunately, in everybody. Pericarditis is a manifestation of, of acute rheumatic fever, um, and you can see the filamentous um, strands in, in this um, pericardial effusion, but sometimes the pericarditis can be very marked. And this is just extremely thickened um, pericardium here, um, adjacent to the left ventricle. Um, and just to wrap things up, um, this is a case study, a 10 year old girl, Pacific Island ethnicity in Auckland. She presented to us with fever and arthralgia. She didn't have a heart murmur. She had a raised CRP and ESR, and she had borderline anemia. She had elevated ASO teters, um, and she was diagnosed with subclinical carditis on the basis of an echocardiogram. Um, and although you can't see the, um, the leaflets particularly well on these pictures, you can see that there's a, a jet that um, is pansystolic, or at least it was on Doppler, um, on, on pulse Doppler, and, and, um, and it extends away into the left atrium. So she had a diagnosis of acute rheumatic fever made. She was started on penicillin. Um, she was rested, which is our local treatment. Um, and um, she recovered, but she represented six months later with fever and a malar rash and a tachycardia, um, elevated ESR and CRP, um, and persistent anemia. She had a pericardial effusion that required drainage and she was positive for lupus anticoagulant and antiphospholipid antibody. Um, so she had a diagnosis of SLE made. And, um, you know, really, I suppose she might have had both um, those things going on, but I, I suspect she had positive ASO teters, um, as a number of children do in her community because of a fairly high prevalence of streptococcus. Um, and, um, and in fact, her first presentation was a very mild degree of, of mitral regurgitation related to her lupus. <coughs> Excuse me. So in conclusion, um, minor valve lesions um, are associated with SLE and JRA in childhood. And they may be similar to those seen during acute rheumatic fever. Vegetations associated with SLE and really JRA may mimic those of bacterial endocarditis, although their character is usually subtly different. Multiple pathologies can coexist, especially bacterial endocarditis and rheumatic heart disease. Um, some of these things come out in the wash with their, with their, over time with their um, correct diagnosis. So it pays to keep an open mind. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, and, um, and thanks to um, the folk at home who helped me out with images um, and cases. Um, and as I said before, I hope to see you all next year.